All right, welcome. This is the fourth class in the Intro to Reverse Engineering course. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter to Tyler at SecShagoth, S-E-C-S-H-O-G-G-O-T-H, or you can uh, contact BreakSec, uh, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C on Twitter. Um, you can also email bds.podcast at gmail.com. And uh, feel free to, uh, you know, hit up the podcast if you've uh, found value in this. We've got a lot of uh, uh, good info over there. Over two, If you're a CISP, uh, CISSP, there's over 200 hours of CPEs available for you there if you're looking for uh, continuing education credits. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler and uh, we can get started. Awesome. Well, let me share my screen. Maybe. All right. So hopefully all of you can see the uh, PowerPoint. Um, can. Awesome. So in this week, we're going to talk about anti-analysis. And um, specifically, we're going to talk about some common anti-analysis and uh, techniques that attackers will use in malware or even in um, a a hacking tools. So, um, a lot of these uh, anti-debugging and anti-disassembling things are, are, are found in, in hacking tools as well. And then the methods that we can use to overcome them. Some of the... Uh, some of the techniques that are used are actually really simple to get around. And so we can, as soon as, as long as you can recognize them, you'll be able to get around them and, and analyze what the attacker doesn't want you to analyze. Um, as always, I've uploaded some files to our uh, share, which is at bit.ly slash break dash RE. Um, I have not uploaded the slides yet, but I will upload them by the end of uh, the session tonight. So, Oh, Dave is not getting any sound. Can everybody else hear me okay? Let's make sure. Sounds like it may just be him. Ah, okay. Well, I'm gonna keep going and hopefully he'll, he'll be able to get on. Um, so, um, the thing with, uh, attackers, especially with malware authors, is they're going to try everything they can to make analysis more difficult because the longer it takes you to analyze their malware, the longer their malware is relevant. Um, think about um, think about WannaCry. Uh, one of the big things about WannaCry was the kill switch. Um, if the authors, had, and once that was found, WannaCry was made um, irrelevant pretty quickly. You know, once that domain was registered, that pretty much killed WannaCry for the most part, uh, except for, you know, a couple of segmented networks or things like that. But it, it, it kind of made it um, pretty, uh, pretty useless at that point. Um, but there was no anti-debugging or anti-disassembling uh, surrounding that portion of the code. So if the attacker had gone in and done some of the techniques that we uh, talked about um, and, or that we're going to talk about and hid their uh, kill switch code, the, it may have been a little bit longer for anybody to realize that that was in there or, or what that, that domain query was really being used for. Uh, and it would have been relevant relevant for more longer uh, or for longer. Um, and if nothing else, the the anti disassembling and anti debugging techniques that we're going to talk about is going to make it harder for you to go in and analyze it. It take these techniques really just take advantage um, of the the way that debuggers and disassemblers work uh, and kind of use those to uh, you use the way that they work against them. And, and you'll see what I mean as, as we start going through. Um, so there are three different categories of techniques. There's uh, anti-disassembly techniques, anti-debugging techniques, and then anti-VM and sandbox techniques. And we're going to, I, I've picked a couple from each of those categories to talk about. Um, the one thing that I want to say is there are dozens, if not hundreds of different techniques out there to make sure that your disassembler doesn't work or that your debugger doesn't work or to, see, or to detect that it's in a virtual machine or a sandbox. I'm only covering the ones that um, I think are the most common uh, and really the ones that you're, you're going to see, you're gonna be able to get around uh, the easiest. All right, so the first one, uh, one thing that I wanna to say too is 
we're not going to talk about any anti-analysis techniques. And, and what I mean by anti-analysis techniques is a lot of malware is starting to move away from the anti-virtual machine uh, techniques because by having those anti-virtual machine techniques in malware, there are less computers that it can, uh, that it can compromise. Uh, when you look at the, how prevalent uh, cloud computing and uh, virtual machines uh, like VMware, ESX, and and the big uh, the uh, the big virtual machine uh, networks that are in organizations now. If uh, malware looks to see if it's on a VM and then stops working, if it is, then it, it's not going to infect as many things as as it could be. So. Um, what a lot of malware has done is moved to anti-analysis techniques. And some of those techniques are actually really simple. They're just the malware looking at the process list and to see if you have something like uh, X6040 bug or IDA Pro running, or uh, if you're doing dynamic analysis, it looks for a process monitor or reg shot or, or any of the other tools that you might use. Um, we're not going to go into those. We're going to focus solely on the techniques that are specific to reverse engineering. <clears throat> All right, we're going to talk or start with anti disassembler techniques. And uh, at any time, uh, oops, sorry. At any time, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. I should be able to see them. Um, so hopefully, we're we're good. Oops. All right. So. With disassemblers, you, you have to understand the way that they work to understand how some of these techniques uh, work or take advantage of them. And disassemblers uh, make some assumptions when they interpret code. And when I say disassemblers, I mean IDA Pro uh, uh, and even uh, sometimes the disassemblers that are in debuggers uh, like uh, X6040 bug. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but they make some assumptions when, when they're interpreting the code. The first assumption is that most will process the false branch of a conditional jump first. What this means is when you get down to a compare and then a jump, it's going to process the false branch of that jump first. So let's say we have a jump zero branch. It will process the bytes after that branch, which is not the, the, the jump, but that's the false branch. And, and you'll see this a bit more clearly when we get into an example. Uh, additionally, um, the bytes after a call within a program or within assembler will be processed before the call itself. So when we go down and we're looking at assembler and we see a call to a function, it will actually process the rest of the bytes after that call before it goes back and, and processes the call itself. Um, and we will uh, see how uh, attackers can take advantage of this, uh, advantage of these assumptions. So the first way that they do this is called junk code. Um, junk code uh, or, or data are inserted after a conditional jump, um, or uh, I'm sorry, they're inserted after a conditional jump or a call um, so that they're analyzed as code. Um, the, the junk it then gets interpreted as instructions instead of something that they're supposed to be. So if we look at this example right here, Actually, let me jump to the next screen. Uh, so if we look at this example right here, uh, we have a call to an address that here's the call and then a near pointer and it is jumping to this address location 401235 plus one. Now, if you ever see something like that, what that means is, uh, we're looking at a screenshot from Ida Pro here. Um, what this means is that Ida Pro saw this call um, to a location, a memory location, but because it did not interpret the memory location as that it, that's being called as an instruction itself, it went back to the nearest one. So, so really what's going on here, um, and I'm not sure if you can, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer. Um, down here, we have uh, location 401235. The call right there is actually jumping to the byte after that. However, Ida Pro did not, uh, interpret that byte, which is at 401236, as an instruction. Uh, and the reason this is, is just because of the way that the junk code works. Um, so we have the call to the address. Um, Ida Pro then analyzes the instructions after the call before it analyzes the call itself. And what's, what's happened here is all of these instructions that you see here um, that I've highlighted in pink are really just junk code that happened to interpret to instructions. The, the attacker was smart enough to 
take, um, just put a bunch of bytes in there that actually interpret into code, even though it's really not going to be doing anything with them. Uh, because when the code is actually executed, it, the code goes through and does that call before it ever goes to those bytes after the call, right? Um, and so it's going to, it's really never going to execute those bytes in there at, at all. And so um, this is really just junk code and it messes up the, uh, the debugger, or I'm sorry, the disassembler as it's going through. And let me move this over. Um, and as you can see, you know, it misinterprets the data as code and, and the instructions and don't get analyzed correctly. And so <clears throat> we're, we're going to see some examples of this. And actually, um, one thing that I should have said is we don't have a homework uh, for this session. Um, first off, because it's, uh, you know, it's a holiday week. Um, and I, I did have actually a really cool one to, to do, but I could not get it to compile right. Um, so because of that, let me... Actually, let me do this. I'm going to stop sharing for one second, and then I'll reshare my entire screen. OK. Um, if you go out to let me pull it up the, the Google Drive and go into class three, you're going to see that there are two files out there. One is called antidis-poc.exe. Um, and then antidis-poc.zip. Uh, now the .exe file is kind of a, a file that we're gonna go through on our own, or not on our own, uh, together, uh, as we go through and talk about the different techniques. The .zip file is actually the source code for this. So if you want to go in and see how this uh, specific techniques that we're talking about can be implemented in uh, C code, uh, you can go in and do that and modify it and play around with it. Um, it should be a full Visual Studio uh, project that you can load into Visual Studio and, and use. But we'll get into that in a couple minutes. So uh, one second. All right, sorry about that. Okay. So we have our junk code. Um, to fix this, it's actually very simple in Ida Pro. All we have to do is undefine the instructions and uh, by, by highlighting the first uh, instruction that we think is junk code. Uh, in this case, we would highlight the pop A uh, command and press U and that undefines those instructions. And then we can redefine the correct ones as code by highlighting the byte that we think is correct and pressing C and that will uh, and then interpret it as code. Now, you can see that you know, on the left-hand side, this is what we saw before. I went and undefined starting at the pop A, and you can see what it un undefined to. You can see, first off, that the call uh, corrected itself to the correct location. And then it looks here that we, it looks like we have a string here uh, being stored in, in this particular value. If I remember correctly, the example that I took this from was the poison ivy back door. So if you go into, um, if you get a sample of poison ivy, or actually you can just download the, the back door and create your own. Uh, if you go in and then start analyzing it in Ida Pro, you'll see things like this. But again, we're gonna see an example of this in, in a couple of minutes and, and we'll go through and, and kind of fool around with it. So that's junk code. Um, <clears throat> another uh, thing that attackers will do um, are false conditions. Um, and like I said before, disassemblers will usually follow the false branch of a conditional jump first. Uh, what I mean by following the false branch, it means that it goes through and it disassembles the false branch first. And then if it needs to, it goes back and disassembles the true branch. Um, we, attackers can use this to force the disassembler to interpret invalid code. And it really works the same concept as the, the junk code does. Uh, whereas, you know, with the junk code, the uh, disassembler is analyzing the code directly after the call. In the, in a false condition case, the, uh, the disassembler is uh, interpreting the code or analyzing the code uh, in the false branch of a uh, conditional jump. So, so in this case right here, we, we have some assembler here. Uh, and our first instruction is an XOR EAX EAX. And um, whenever you XOR the same value, what does that do? can't see the chat, so hopefully somebody's, all right, zero, it zeroes it out, 
Okay, so what, it's zeroing out EAX, uh, and then it's it's doing a jump zero. Now the fact that uh, EAX was zeroed out means that the zero flag was set and so that the jump zero is always going to be true um, because uh, when you XOR EAX comma EAX, you're, you're creating zero. And so this jump zero flag or conditional jump right here is always going to be true. It's always going to jump. It's essentially an unconditional uh, jump. Um, however, because it's a jump, it's, a, it's technically a conditional jump uh, instruction the disassembler is always going to uh, interpret the junk code first. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the false branch first. And the false branch is the byte right after that uh, jump zero command. You can see that the jump zero on, on the, the true branch, it jumps to location 401023 plus one. So it's jumping to 401024. Um, the next, ins uh, the next instruction then is at 401023 because the jump zero command is, is two bytes long. Um, and so it will interpret that. And you can see there at 401023, uh, it interprets that next command as a call near pointer and then you know some address. And if you ever see Ida Pro with a red address, that's usually a flag that, you know, some, something's going on. Either you have some anti-disassembly going on or a packed program or, or something along those lines because um, Ida Pro found an address that the, the program is accessing and it doesn't know where that is. All right. Um, so just like uh, the, the junk code, in order to fix this, all we have to do is undefine the incorrect instructions by you know, highlighting the incorrect instructions and pressing U, and then going to the correct instructions uh, that it goes to and press C to define the code. And this is what I did. I, on the top here, we have the uh, incorrect uh, code. Uh, this is before. Um, I went in and undefined the, the uh, code at 401023. And then since I knew that it was jumping to 401024, I went and pressed C on that address and it showed me the correct code. Now, the one thing that I'll say, and we'll see this in a second, is that when you define code within Ida Pro, you may have to do it multiple times. Um, Ida Pro is good, but it doesn't always get everything correctly. So you may define some code and then you may need, to, you'll see it go down a little bit and then it'll, it'll have some bytes which you're pretty sure are code, so you have to define that as code. And we'll see that in a second. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about here in, in a second. All right, so this is gonna be our first demo. Um, hopefully you guys will be able to follow along. Um, if you haven't, uh, go ahead and download the anti-disk poc.exe. Um, it is not malware. Um, you have the source code for it, so you can see what it's doing. However, I'm not gonna guarantee that your antivirus is not going to detect it as uh, as malware because of the techniques that are implemented within it. Um, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, because of uh, the way that, you know, uh, Visual C++ compiles things, um, there's a lot of initialization code. So you want to set a breakpoint at 4010, oh, I'm sorry, 40, uh, the, sorry, let we're gonna use Ida Pro, so let me let me start over again. You want to go to location four zero one one zero zero. That's the start of the actual code that we're gonna be looking at. And you can go in and execute it. In fact, you know, let me do that right now. All right, let me pull up the chat, make sure I can see. Oh, so there's a question uh, it's from Jerry. So if we can see something that looks wrong or prom hung jumping, can we just nap the rogue byte or bytes? Uh, you can. Um, so, so Jerry's asking, you know, can we just go and patch these rogue, rogue bytes uh, to, uh, to no op, um, which if you're not familiar with what no op is, it basically means do nothing. It's a hex 90 character. Um, so is it a good practice to skip them or not a good practice? Um, I would say that you may want to try to get around them uh, if you can, uh, especially if you're in, if you're in Ida Pro. Um, if you're in a debugger and you you have to do it every time, just go ahead and patch them and, and not them, uh, as long as it's not going to affect the uh, the program. Um, so hopefully that that answers your question. So um, here is uh, anti uh, disk dash poc, and my chat window just died. So if 
Somebody let me know if uh, somebody says anything. Um, if you run it, it's going to just throw up a whole bunch of me message boxes uh, it's telling you where these um, uh, different uh, techniques are happening. So I'm going to load this into Ida Pro. I'll load this up. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Or is that too small? Let me see if I can increase the font just a little bit. All right, let me do that and then leave. Oh, come on. All right, that looks a little better. Okay, increase this. Move this down. All right, so we want to go to four zero one one zero zero. And again, the reason I'm, I'm saying that is because um, that's where our, our code starts. I just went in and got that for you so you didn't have to hunt around for it. Now, first thing you should notice um, is that Ida Pro does not even recognize this as a function. Um, if you click on the functions tab, you can see that there are, it sees a lot of functions in there uh, within, the, uh, within the program but it doesn't recognize this as a function. And if you look at the, the source code, this is absolutely a function. Um, the reason it doesn't recognize it as a function is because uh, it, um, there are some errors in here uh, as it was disassembling. And so it doesn't feel that it's, a, it's a truly a real function. And those errors are from the, uh, from, from the anti-disassembling code that we have in here. Um, we can tell that it's a function because we see the function prologue at the very start. Um, now, if at some point we fix all the errors, we can actually go in and um, select the beginning address. And if you right click and go to create function or press P, you can create a function out of it. But um, you can't do that now because there are errors. So I saw somebody put something in chat. You had a couple errors when dropping this on Ida. Um, did it still let you load up the, the program? Cool. All right, as long as it loads up, um, you should be okay. <clears throat> so if we go down here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at, four zero, at address 40111C, this is the start of uh, a, um, uh, this should be the start of some junk code. So here, uh, some junk code and a false condition actually combined. So at 40111C, we have an XOR EAX EAX. This is very, very similar to what we saw before. Then we have a jump zero. And because we have the XOR EAX EAX here, this jump zero is always going to be true. Now you can see that it's going to an, an address that Ida Pro was not able to correctly interpret. And what's happening here is at um, this, at 401120, I'm sorry. So what's happening here is it interpreted the uh, false, um, it interpreted the, the false branch first, which was the bytes right after this, which was this jump uh, command uh, or the bytes that equal to this jump command. Um, However, you can see that this uh, jump is actually to uh, a, the byte that's after that. So in order for us to fix this, I'm going to highlight the jump. Um, uh, you can, there are, like I said, there are, uh, you can press a U for this, or I'm just going to right click and go to undefine. Do you want to undefine? Yes. Uh, and you can see that first off, <clears throat> a couple things happened. Uh, first off, these two bytes uh, became undefined. So all you are seeing here are the bytes. Uh, you can see up here that the jump changed from saying 401120 plus one to this unknown uh, at this address. And it says unknown because, because it doesn't know what that is. It just sees it as data right now. Uh, in a second, it'll, you'll see this turn into a location. And then down here, I, I believe some of these instructions uh, changed as well. And that's because when you undefine code, Ida Pro is going to go back in and try to reinterpret some of the instructions following that. And that's what it reinterpreted them as. But we know that this location right here, uh, 401121, uh, is actually code. So we can right click on it and go down to the uh, code or we can just press C. And when we do that, it's going to reinterpret a, a bunch of these instructions. 
So do I want it to convert to code? Yes. And we see <clears throat> that up here, the jump now changed to a location underscore 401121. And this first instruction was changed to push zero. Now, you can see that these two bytes afterwards uh, are showing as bytes and not as a as instructions. And this is what I meant by you may have to go in and press C multiple times. So I'm just going to do that again on this. Yes, I want to convert it. And I'm basically just going to keep going and doing that until I get to something that looks pretty clean. And that's what I'm seeing right here. <clears throat> so the only thing that the attacker did was uh, when they were writing their the malware or their program, they changed this, uh, they created this jump uh, zero uh, or forced this jump zero to happen and then put this byte afterwards, this, this EB uh, byte. Um, and that the EB is actually the first uh, two bytes of a jump uh, command. And so what happens is the, um, the jump zero, because of the false branch, this byte gets interpreted before this location here. And so it got interpreted and all the code got messed up. So does that make sense? Uh, does anybody have any questions on that? <clears throat> what is, uh, we will get to that in a second. Um, the dollar sign plus five, we are actually going to talk about that next, I think. We're, we're gonna talk about it here in, in, in a couple of seconds, at least, a minute. All right, so it looks like everything is good. Um, let me make sure that there's no other. Yep. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, question. Okay. So the code we can go read in the folder mm -hmm. will actually run, execute and perform its intended purpose. However, well, it's only when a disassembler passes over it that it gets all jumbled because of the way it was built. Is that what we're, what we're learning here? Is that what we saw? Yes. So, so the two techniques that we just talked about are specifically for uh, to make disassembling harder. Um, so, the the whole goal of those two techniques was to mess up what we had here. Um, it, when you run it, and in fact, you can still, um, you know, this is the, the compiled. Uh, program for it when you yeah, run it. Yeah, I guess maybe my question is, like, right, like if we put this through the debugger, would it look different and it act different and it would just sort of do its purpose? It's only when we disassemble, then now it looks all jumbled. This specific yeah. program? Yeah, if we put this through the debugger, it, this oh. section would look different, uh, right? Or no? Yes, it, it will look different, but it will still execute the same way. And the reason why it will look different is because some of the uh, anti disassembling um, uh, techniques that we just talked about don't get uh, don't affect uh, the way that the, the debugger is implemented. Um, we'll talk about some specific uh, anti debugging techniques, which will cause uh, a debugger to act a little bit differently. But, th but these techniques, their, their sole purpose are so that the, the program will, will um, as long as it's not in a disassembler or a debugger, will work properly. Um, if it is in a disassembler or debugger, then it messes up the output and uh, causes it not to function properly. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I was just trying to picture what it would be like to, like, how does this work with someone write the code? Oh, let me, let me edit, this in hex, edit this in hex, edit in hex later. You or can. Or like a tool you pass over your thing when you're done. Or, yeah. Um, you can, you can do uh, any of that. Um, here, let me open up the, the source code and I'll show you. So this is the source code. Um, if it'll stop loading. Okay. This is just the source code of what we just went through. Um, you, when, when you're writing in C code, you can add in uh, assembler into uh, directly into a C program uh, or C plus plus program. And so what we had here is um, the stuff that we just looked at is all of this right here. Um, just that small section. Uh, what I did was <clears throat> I added some assembler um, that would uh, push EAX. So it'll save EAX then it XORs it and then it jumps, uh, does the jump zero um, down from down to this section right here. 
Uh, and then <clears throat> right after it, I, I do the uh, underscore emit command, which all of that means is just put this byte right here. Um, and all of this code right here is all you need to implement that. And the program will run, will, uh, run correctly in when we execute it, as you see, because the, if you run it, you should see that message box pop up. But in a debugger we do, or in a disassembler, we don't see that because of the, 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 false, um, uh, the, the false condition byte. Does that help? Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> so let's jump back. All right. All right. So those were, let me pull that. There we go. Okay. So those were um, two uh, conditions or two techniques. Um, there's also another technique uh, that takes advantage of the way that uh, call and returns work. Um, now, if you recall, uh, when a, a call occurs, the um, EIP uh, instruction or the EIP register, which is pointing to the uh, next instruction to be executed, is pushed onto the stack. Okay, and so when a return is called, um, that address is popped off the stack back into EIP, and that's how the processor knows where to go back to in order to, to start processing. So in our little example here, um, we have a function call. We, uh, first thing it does is it pushes 0xfoo on, onto the stack. That's a parameter that, it, that it's calling. Then it calls the function, and when it calls the function, the next instruction after the function to be, that's supposed to be executed is at 4008. And so it push, and that's what EIP is set to, and so it pushes that onto the stack. That's how a normal call works. Now, attackers will take advantage of this, and this is getting into where, what the uh, call dollar sign plus five uh, is. Um, so give me one second. So attackers can take advantage of this by um, m basically modifying the, uh, the return address from a call um, to, to make it become a unconditional jump. And the way that they do this is they'll first do a, a call dollar sign plus five. And really all that means is take the current instruction pointer, add five to it, and that's the address that you're going to use. Whenever you see the dollar sign, that essentially means the, the current instruction pointer or the value of EIP or, or the value that, it, that it's at. Um, so what we have here is we have call dollar sign plus five. Uh, five plus five is 10, which in hex is A. So what's happening here with, with this call is it's really calling, uh, performing a function call, but it's going to four zero 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 A. Um, now the next instruction to get pushed onto the stack uh, would normally be uh, four zero 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 A, um, right? Because that would be the next instruction to be uh, to be done by the call, but we just called that. So at that instruction, it pushes the value of the fun or the the location of the address that it wants to actually go to onto the stack, and then it makes a return uh, call. So what happens is when it gets to that return, uh, the first thing that it's going to do is pop off the next uh, value off the stack uh, and jump to that. Well, since the attacker pushed where they wanted to go to onto the stack uh, at that um, 40,000 FF, it's going to go to that uh, location instead of the the call uh, or where it normally would have gone to and so it by doing that it's essentially creating this um, unconditional jump uh, and jumping all over code and it can do and the reason that the attackers will do this is because um, if they use it with junk code then the disassembler isn't going to interpret the uh, correct the code correctly and it may not even find the new code to execute um, not only that it sometimes malware will do this in order to find the address that it's at so it can start modifying things in memory um, let's do this i think it's going to be a little bit more clear if we go back into our uh, debugger so or disassembler so 
where I got lost with where I'm at. Here we go. All right. So if you go down to instruction um, 401136, um, this is where we, we have an example of this. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, if you go down to 4011B, okay, um, 4011B, uh, we have a call uh, percent plus five. So it takes uh, that value, 4B, uh, adds five to it, and you, if you do that, you'll get uh, five zero. Um, one of the cool things within Ida Pro, if you haven't done this, um, if you press uh, the question mark, it'll bring up a little uh, calculator for you or an expression evaluator. So if you didn't know what 4B plus five was, you can just type 0x4B plus five, click okay, and it'll tell you. Um, this is actually really helpful if you have uh, a number of different uh, addresses that start getting uh, added together within the assembly. Um, it's nice that it will actually just do it for you instead of you trying to figure it out by hand. <clears throat> oops, sorry. So, oops. So um, we have our call instruction here. Um, it will call this instruction. Um, so it jumps down to right here. And then it pushes this uh, location 401190 onto the stack. Uh, and then it returns. And so when it does that, instead of executing this code right here, it jumps down to right here, 401. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There's, no, go ahead. There was a question. Um, oh, okay. Um, in, the, I mean, in the chat. I'm trying to pull it. All right. Would there be a condition where seeing percent plus something is a legitimate thing in executable code? Um, Yes, I think there would be the, the reason, well, obviously there is some type of legitimate um, reason for it or else uh, they, the designers wouldn't have implemented it. Um, I believe, I'm trying to think where I've seen this in legitimate code. Um, I want to be honest with you, I, I'm sure there are legitimate reasons for it, and you might see it within very optimized code. Um, the code that I compiled here, I did not optimize, um, but I suspect that with some optimization, you may see that more, uh, and so that that would um, cause it to see it. Now, if you're, if you're looking at malware and, and you see this, chances are it's not um, legitimate. Um, in fact, uh, You'll see this a lot with shellcode, uh, shellcode in exploits or shellcode in, in documents um, or, or things like anywhere where, where shellcode is sent as opposed to a uh, full program. You'll see a lot of these calls uh, in order to find the address that it's in and so it can bounce around in memory and, and do things like that. All right. So really the best way for us to, to see, you know, I, I'm kind of describing what this will do, but let's go in and actually look at what it's doing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take our program and I'm gonna load it into a debugger. Um, and I'm gonna set a breakpoint at this call. So 401.14b. Now, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, there are a couple ways that you can set breakpoints. Uh, you can go in and you can find the um, instruction that you want to breakpoint at and select it and press F2 and it'll breakpoint, uh, set a breakpoint there. Um, you can click on the breakpoints tab and then um, do add exception breakpoint. Uh, that's for something a little bit different. Um, I thought there was a way to do it in here, but apparently not. Um, or I believe if down here um, at the very bottom, uh, it may be difficult to see. There's this little command tab. And there are a lot of uh, commands that you can um, add to or type in to uh, X32 uh, debug or X64 debug. One of them um, is set BPX, which is uh, set breakpoint. Um, and then if I believe if you just give it the address and then press enter, it should set a breakpoint there. Yes, sweet. And we can tell if it was, uh, if it's set by clicking on the breakpoint. And then we see that um, the address that I wanted it to uh, breakpoint at 40114B was set. So all I'm gonna do is uh, start running it. 
Um, you can click the run key here or hit F9. Um, it, let me expand this a little bit. Um, we had our first breakpoint, the, uh, the entry point. That's not what we want. So I'm going to click again. Then these are, this is a breakpoint I set up earlier. Let's get down to maybe. Oh, sorry. It wants me to click through these. All right, so here we are down at 40114B. Now, this is this value right here. So what it's doing is it's interpreting the percent plus five, or percent, the um, dollar sign plus five, uh, and the debugger is actually just replacing it with the actual value. So like we said before, when we execute this, what it's going to do is doing a call, um, it's going to, first push the next in the instruction pointer onto the stack and then the instruction pointer is this value so it should push this one onto the stack um, and then it will start executing at, at this value so I'm going to hit F8 and I'm sorry so we can see that the instruction pointer was set correctly I, I misspoke before um, it, the return value is 401150 uh, which is uh, where the instruction right after the call, um, which just happens to be the instruction that we went to. Um, and this next one is, uh, next instruction is, is pushing the, the value 401190 um, onto the stack. So I'm gonna hit F8. And you can see that it pushed that value down here onto the stack. Let me increase this a little bit so you can see it. And then it's gonna return. Now, if, uh, if this did not work properly, then after this return, it would either start executing back up here or it would start executing down here and it would pop up a message box that said this should not appear. Um, however, because it has the 401190 in there, it will start executing all the way down here. Um, and then it will uh, print the message box out from jump via, jump via return. So what I'm gonna do is we're right here, I'm gonna press F8 uh, and you'll see that it jumps um, from this location all the way down to the 401190, which it did. Now, again, you know, the, the reason that the uh, malware does this is, um, first off, uh, if it had put some junk code after this call, um, then it would have started to misinterpret the, the junk code. Because remember, uh, in a disassembler, the bytes after a, uh, after a call are interpreted before the call itself. Um, in this case, that's not what happened. In this case, that's not what happened. Uh, instead, it just went there and it did that to basically jump and skip around all of these bytes. So in this particular case, this is really more of an example. It's not showing, you know, um, why uh, a real reason why it would happen, but you know, it's just something that's um, the way that it works. And again, if you wanted to go in and uh, see the way that it works in the source code, uh, it happens right here. I, I, I it starts uh, right after this message box jump via ret. We have the pop eax, the call. Um, to right here, then it pushes the value of a call check, which is the location down here, and then the, re the return. And it skips all of this code in between, which is a um, message box and then this for loop that I just threw in there to add some more code in there. Um, and then down here, uh, we have the message box and then it cleans up EAX, uh, or it cleans up the stack. Because remember, um, there's, there's still a extra value on the stack. Um, if you look back here in the debugger, you know, when we returned, um, actually, let me, let me restart here. If you ever need to control while you, uh, restart it. While you restart that, there was a, was a pretty good question. Okay. Um, there, uh, if you want, <clears throat> if you wanted to practice this, like reverse here, does it sound like, are there any recommended samples you know of that use this, um, that we can try this is only, I guess, in addition to what's in our, in our uh, class exercise. So that, that was the problem that I had. And that's another reason why I didn't have any really good homework uh, for this. Um, oops, there's no examples that I can think of um, off the top of my head, which 
do all of these. And that's why I created this specific sample. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. The, the best thing that I can say is I, I know, and I've said this um, previously, the, uh, um, the poison ivy backdoor uh, does implement a lot of these. Uh, so if you, uh, let me see if I can even pull that up. I'm not gonna do that in window in, in Explorer. Um, I don't know if it's still up, if I can spell. There used to be a website for it. There you go. I don't know if it still works. Oh, I'm probably just compromising myself. Um, all right, so if you, I will try to find a sample of poison ivy and throw it up on here um, for people to analyze. Um, I know it does implement some of these techniques and um, if I come across any in the next week or so, I'll, I'll make sure that I throw them out to everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm also going to try to get the, the, the original homework that I had uh, created to work because basically what that does is it implements all these techniques um, and you're supposed to kind of get around them in order to figure out a password. Um, unfortunately, like I said, for some reason the compilation wasn't working properly and so I wasn't able to get it going. Um, but, oh, but um, so hopefully that answered the question. Like I said, if, if I find more, I will um, definitely uh, post them. Um, so well, what I was saying before is, so let's go, through, let's step through this again. You know, first off, we're back at our original instruction. Uh, we're, we're doing the call to the next instruction and it pushes the EIP onto the stack. All right. This is going to be our return value. And you can even see here, hopefully you can see, um, that, uh, X32 debug labels this as the return value. Um, and then I'm pushing, uh, the real return value on that I want to use. And then I'm calling my return. And so what's going to happen is when I, when, I, when I execute this next return, this value right here is going to get popped off the stack because that's where we're going to. And that's what happens. However, you can see here that this re the original return value from our call is still on there. And so the malware kind of has to clean up the stack a little bit or else when it exits the, the function that it's in right now, it's not going to exit properly. In fact, if it would go through and do that, if it would not clean up the stack, what would happen is um, either the, the stack is gonna become corrupt and your program is gonna crash or it's gonna make it down to the very end of the um, function and then this is going to be its return value and so it's almost going to become like it's in an infinite loop or it's actually go or it'll go through and execute the code again which could cause issues so that was a long way for me to say that that's why it's doing the pop eax here so that it can uh, clean up the stack all right any other questions on that <clears throat> okay, so that was anti disassembling. Um, and again, anti disassembling is really more just to kind of screw up the disassembler so that when you look at the code, it looks all screwed up or um, things uh, don't don't look right. They, they don't always affect um, debuggers. Um, I will say that sometimes they do affect debuggers. But the one thing that I found out is, um, even though it will look incorrect in a debugger when you start stepping through it or running the program in the debugger the debugger will figure out that hey this is wrong and it will it will it or it should um execute the correct uh commands or correct instructions um <clears throat> okay so one other thing that i want to say too is um let me let me jump back into uh, ida pro for one second Actually, let me just, let me reload this. Cause I, I wanna show you guys one other thing. Uh, so right. All right, so 401110. All right, so here we are um, in back in our code. Now, the more you look at uh, assembler or you, the more you look at something, uh, look at things in Ida Pro or debugger, um, the more you're going to kind of get a, a feeling for what 
valid assembler code looks like. Um, there are going to be times where you're going to be going through and you're going to see something like this. And you're going to start seeing weird things like this XOR of this really long value and then XOR of EAX to against EAX plus zero. And it's just, it's not going to make sense. And, and you may even see instructions that you've never seen before. Um, when you start seeing those, that's another good indication that there could be some anti disassembling going on here. Um, and as you saw, you know, when we undefined this, and then redefine the correct code and went through and redefined all the rest of the code correctly. It looked, uh, it looked better, it looked more real. Um, and because of that, uh, the, the more you look at you know, legitimate code or legitimate assembler, the, the easier it's gonna be for you to spot the, those weird locations where things just don't look right. Um, and if you do come across some place where things just don't look right, you know, try undefining a couple places and redefining the code and see if that fixes it. Or even just go into uh, select, highlight the value or the location of it and select hex view. And you may find a string there. A lot of times malware will put strings right in uh, the middle of code and then use these techniques to get around them. Um, Poison Ivy, I'll, I'll tell you the, the um, call, uh, let me jump back to the PowerPoint. Um, I, can, I can tell you for a fact that Poison Ivy, it uses this jump via ret uh, in order to uh, load strings. Um, what it'll do is it'll have this call to some location later on. Um, oh, let me think, let me remember how it does this. Um, uh, I, so I, I'm, I would have, I need to go back and look, but I believe that what it does is it, it, it has one of these calls and then it pushes the real location onto the stack and then returns. But this value uh, in here, um, th this location in here between the return and where it jumps to is actually a string and it, and it does that so that it can figure out where those strings are and, and interpret it correctly. And it does that to dynamically load DLLs and APIs. Um, when you when you go through that, I know I definitely have a, a sample of Poison Ivy that, that does that. Um, I will definitely send that out along with some notes on how you can see that. Okay. Let me make sure we're good in the chat. Cool. All right. So we talked about anti-disassembling. Let's talk a little bit about anti-debugging. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the goal of anti-debugger techniques are to essentially make the debugger not work. Um, you know, you're, you're going to use a debugger when you're looking at malware to, to figure out how the malware is doing what it's doing. Um, the, the, uh, the malware authors don't want you to do that, or they want to you know, make this as, as difficult as the, they can um, for you. Uh, and so they're going to use these anti-debugger techniques to basically make sure that your debugger doesn't work. Um, so fortunately though, once you can, once you identify these techniques, um, the, the solutions are pretty much the same. Um, first, you can either identify the technique and then patch the code to, uh, performing the technique to basically no ops so that they don't work. Or you can use a plugin to bypass the technique totally. Uh, and we're gonna talk about one really good plugin for uh, X32 debug and X64 debug that, that works really, really well. And that, uh, uh, plugin is called uh, Silahide or, or Skillahide. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, but that's the location there. But um, basically, what it does is it will hide your debugger from a number of different techniques that uh, a number of different anti debugging techniques. Um, the nice thing about it is is it has these uh, profiles loaded by default, um, and so you can just go in and if you know the, the type of protection that, that was put on a executable, you can just load up that profile and it will get around it for you. Or you can just start going in and create your new pro, a new profile and just you know, select everything and you know, see if your program runs in the debugger as it goes through. Um, I do wanna show you, uh, Silent Debug is not the easiest to install. It, it, it's kind of weird. Um, so let me, I have my notes here. Let's go in and the way that uh, you do it. So let me 
So on our share, you should see um, the zip file for it. And if you open up the zip file under the release directory are gonna be a ton of different um, uh, files. Fortunately, you don't need to install all of them. There is a PDF file in here <clears throat> that does contain instructions on how to, um, how to install it. Uh, but I'm just gonna walk you through just because it's a little bit easier then. Um, so first thing you need to do is go to the directory where you installed x64 debug. Um, and within x64 debug, you're gonna have two directories underneath it. You're gonna have the release directory and then you're gonna have two directories underneath there, x32 and x64. Um, what you wanna do first is go into the x32 directory and then the plugins directory. And then you want to copy over the See the NT API collection, the INI file, the Sila underscore hide file, or dot INI file, um, in, and we're doing this into the X32 uh, slash plugins directory. The let's see here hook library 86 directory or file, uh, and then you copy those over, and then under the plugins directory for for Sila hide you're going to have a uh, file that ends in .dp32. You wanna copy that over, and that's, that's what I did over here. You wanna have these files over here. And then go back up to the, uh, under x64 debugs, x64 directory uh, into its plugins, and do the same thing, except uh, you're gonna copy the same files, except instead of hook library x86, you'll copy over hooks, hook library x64, and then the .dp64 uh, file. Uh, and once you do that, uh, you should be able to load um, x32 debug or x64 debug and see it in the, in the plugins directory. So show you that. So I'll just load up x32 debug. If I go to the plugins directory, I, then I see Scylla hide here. There, there's also a Scylla or Scylla uh, up here. This is a different plugin. Uh, we, the one we loaded is Scylla hide. What you can do is uh, go over to um, options and then you can just select uh, which ones you want. Um, now, <clears throat> one thing uh, that I've noticed is that when you select something and uh, let's say you add something else and click uh, OK, um, if you have a program already loaded, it says you don't need to reload the program in order to get those new um, options working. I have not found that to always be the case. Um, it could just be I was doing it uh, incorrectly, um, but you know, for some reason, um, sometimes I found that you have to actually totally reload X32 debug in order to get it uh, to work. So, so that's how that's how you get it loaded. All right, but this is an excellent plugin to help you bypass a lot of the uh, anti-debugging uh, techniques that we're going to talk about. So one of the easiest techniques uh, is a, a Windows API called is debugger present. And this uh, API um, does just what it sounds like. It, it checks to see if there's a user mode debugger being used on this program. Now, to get down into the, the dirty details of how it does this, the API really just goes in and checks a, um, a data block within the process called the process environment block or the PEB. Um, and it checks the second, uh, the PEB is essentially just an array of data. And uh, at the, at the um, offset number two, so the, the third location uh, of the PEB is a, uh, is a, uh, it's essentially just a field called being debugged. And what happens is when you have a user mode debugger, it sets that value to true or one or whatever it sets it to. So really all is debugger present doing is it's going through and it's checking to see um, if that is set. If it is, it's uh, you know set to true. Um, now, obviously because this is a Windows API, is debugger present is actually pretty easy to spot. Um, if you think a uh, malware may be using it, all you have to do is check the import address table and look to see if is debugger present is loaded or is, is being loaded. Now, I have also seen that in some of the later versions of um, Visual Studio, there are times when um, 
certain options are, are turned on is debugger present will automatically be being loaded by the initialization for, for whatever reason. Um, so just because you see is debugger present in uh, the input address table doesn't necessarily mean the malware is using it, uh, but it's probably a pretty good uh, indication that it's being used. And so you should uh, set up your debugger plugin to um, not, uh, to make sure that it's not found. Um, now, because the uh, is debugger present um, is easy to spot, um, it, and it's really just checking that one field in the PEB, um, you know, a lot of malware uh, authors have decided, you know, instead of calling is debugger present, they're just going to check it for it manually. And they can do that with these four lines of assembler code right here. Um, basically what it does is it uh, loads the PEB into EAX and it does that by specifying the FS uh, register colon 30H. That, that actually takes you to where the PEB is for that process in memory. Then it moves that into EAX, then it moves the, uh, the second bit uh, into, I'm sorry, the second byte into uh, EAX, and then it looks at that. And if it's um, zero, uh, it's, not, it's not being debugged. Um, so it's very easy for uh, malware authors to, ch to check for this. Um, and there are actually a lot of other APIs that can be used to check for a debugger. Um, there's one in kernel 32 called check remote debugger present. There's one in NTDLL. There's another in kernel 32. There's probably about two dozen different ways for uh, malware authors to check if a debugger is present. Um, but fortunately, like we said, it's, it's actually fairly simple to get around. Um, most uh, most debugger plugins that that hide things are, are fairly good at hiding uh, from uh, uh, this API call or from the manual checks into the PEB. Uh, and here are some other ones. Um, if you, uh, I'm not going to go through each of these codes, um, but you know these are just other ways to detect uh, debuggers. Um, if you ever see any code like this uh, being called, then um, you know that it, this is what it's doing. It's looking to see if the uh, uh, if a debugger is attached to this uh, particular program to, or to the malware. And then, of course, you know if it finds that it, there is a debugger present, it's going to do something different than it normally would. It might execute, or you know, it might uh, trash the debugger or, or do something to the file system. Um, it's not going to do what it normally does. Okay, so any uh, any questions on that? And we'll see an example of this here in, in a couple minutes, both with and without the plugin. Okay, are there, uh, okay, so, um, all right, so let's keep going. So let's talk a little bit about breakpoints. Um, we've, I, we've really just talked about how to set breakpoints uh, in, in our debuggers, but we haven't really talked about what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of important uh, to know when we start talking about anti-disassembling. Um, so the first type of breakpoint is just a, a normal breakpoint. It's, it's typically, what ha typically what happens in the debugger when you hit F2 um, is that the debugger is actually replacing the opcode at that instruction with the value CC. Um, hex CC, um, and this stands for an, an interrupt three breakpoint debugger, or a breakpoint interrupt. And so what happens is uh, when a program is going, is running, and it comes across the int three instruction, the CC, it throws out a breakpoint interrupt. Uh, and the debugger, what's supposed to happen is uh, the debugger will catch that, in, uh, that exception uh, when the interrupt is run, and then it will take control of the program. And that, that's really how the operating system hands control off to the debugger. Um, now, there are a couple other breakpoints that you can set. Uh, there's a breakpoint called a memory breakpoint. And what this does is it will find the memory page, uh, which is normally 4K of memory, uh, that the instruction you want to break on. Uh, is at, uh, so it finds that memory page, and it sets a specific attribute called uh, guard page on it. So what happens is whenever that, when, then whenever that memory is accessed, the a exception is thrown, uh, a guard page exception is thrown, and the debugger will cache that, and then it knows that it set that, uh, that exception, and so it will look to see where it's at, and if it's the, the place in memory that you wanted to stop at. 
Excuse me. And then finally, there's something called a hardware breakpoint. And this is a breakpoint that's set within the CPU. Um, there is a, I think it's a, another register that you can set um, within the CPU of a memory location. And the CPU knows that when that memory location is accessed, that it's supposed to stop working or it's, it's supposed to stop uh, executing that. And the debugger knows how to intercept that breakpoint. And so uh, it will uh, stop it at that point and then take control uh, within the debugger. So there are these three different types of breakpoints. The, the one that's really uh, important uh, to remember is the normal breakpoint. And what, it, and that what it's doing is that it's replacing the opcode of the instruction with uh, CC, with the instruction CC. And then of course, after uh, it stops there, it, it replaces it back to what it, what it should be. Um, but attackers will actually use this to their advantage, advantage to detect that they're in a uh, debugger. Um, so, since debuggers are replacing uh, instructions with uh, the int3 opcode, the, the CC, when we're using software breakpoints or the normal breakpoints, they can then go through and scan for int CC uh, instructions within uh, their uh, section of code. Uh, and if they find those, then they know that there's a, uh, a um, debugger or a breakpoint set uh, and that they're in a debugger. Um, I've seen malware just you know stop working when they see that. I've also seen malware when they find those instructions, then they replace those instructions with something else or they have it jump to some other locations and that kind of messes around with the, the debugger as well. Um, but it's fairly easy for uh, attackers or malware to look for this. All they have to do is you know, find the code in memory and just go through every byte within that and look for the value CC. Uh, and if they find it, then they know that they're being debugged. Um, so let me show you an example of this uh, in, our original, um, in our original program. Uh, or our proof of concept program. So I'm gonna run this uh, without, without being in the debugger. Um, and one thing I want you to pay attention to is after this, uh, we get to this uh, message box that says starting anti-debug code. And then it, it, uh, we're actually running is debugger present and we can see that there's no debugger detected. Um, and then it does not detect any int threes uh, within our, our main uh, section of code. So that's what we want to, to, to try to get to. So what I'm gonna do is I have my debugger here and I'm gonna run it in the debugger with nothing uh, enabled, with, with uh, everything within uh, Skylar Hyde uh, disabled. So if, if our program works correctly, when we run it, um, we should see it detect that it's in a debugger. So I'm gonna hit F9 I have to probably hit it a couple of times because I do have some breakpoint set. So here we have our start of our junk code condition, jump for your ret. Here's my breakpoint that I set before. All right, so it's starting the anti-debug code. And then it, it called is debugger present. So it detected that it was in the debugger. So, you know, that's obviously not working. And then it did detect the breakpoint in main. We do have some breakpoints set up so some instructions here are set to CC, uh, and so it um, detected those. In fact, it detected more than one. All right, so let's do that now. And I'm just going to load VM protect. Click apply, okay. And then I'm gonna restart it. And hopefully now, the, at least the is debugger present is not going to um, be detected. So let's run it. Hit F9 again, again. Here we have our little pop-up here. Hit F9 again, come on. All right, so here we're starting our anti-debug code. And is debugger present failed? Even though we're in a debugger, uh, our plugin hid it from it. Um, and then I click OK. It's still detecting the int CCs in main, um, but at least we got around the int debug present uh, or is, is debug present. Now, the way for us to get around the breakpoints uh, within uh, main, uh, and let me just kind of go till I get to the main function. 
There you go. Um, the way we can get around for them searching for CCs, and all right, so you're going to see some CCs right here. I'm going to explain what those are in a second. So ignore those. Um, but we have a breakpoint right here. We have a breakpoint right here. Um, the way that we can get around that um, is by not setting a software breakpoint or hitting F2. Um, so I just unset it. We can right click on there and go and set either a memory or a hardware breakpoint. Um, so I just go to the breakpoint menu and then I'll, I'll, it's allowing me to set a hardware breakpoint. So I set hardware on execution. What that means is when it gets executed, um, oh, it also means that X64 is gonna crash on you. Let's try that again. Sorry, for some reason, every once in a while that does uh, crash on you. All right. So are my breakpoint still set? Yes. So let me, let me jump back in there. Actually, go to 401100. All right, we have our first breakpoint right here. I'm going to unset this and I'm going to set it to be a hardware breakpoint. And then down here, I'm going to unset this breakpoint and I'm going to reset it back as another hardware breakpoint. And you can see here that uh, when we click on the breakpoints tab, we see that we have two hardware breakpoints here. Now, you are limited in the number of hardware breakpoints that you can have set. I believe you can only have set a maximum of four hardware breakpoints at any time. Uh, I could be wrong on that number, but I, I'm pretty sure it's four. But um, let's go ahead and start our program. Okay, so we hit our first hardware breakpoint at the beginning of our main function at 401100. And we can tell that we hit the hardware breakpoint because down here in the lower left corner, it says hardware breakpoint uh, was executed or was uh, implemented. So gonna keep going, click through these first sets. We hit our second hardware breakpoint. So here we start the anti-debug code. We passed our is debugger present. And if this worked, um, when I click okay here, it will not detect the breakpoints that we set in the main function. Cool, and so it did not detect those. And the way that we got around setting the software breakpoints or the CCs is because of the, um, we set hardware breakpoints instead. So that's how you get around that. Now, I did, let me make sure there's no questions right now. Cool, no questions yet? Um, so I'm loading it back up into uh, IDA because it's a little bit easier to show you it in IDA Pro. Um, so let me jump to 411. Uh -oh. Now, you may have noticed that um, between our functions, there are a number of CCs. There's some right here, there's some right here. If we start looking around um, between other functions, we'll probably start seeing blocks of CCs. Um, what's going on here is that the compiler, in order to memory align uh, places uh, in the code, um, it needs to, let me, let me take a step back. So when, when the compiler runs, so when the compiler compiles the code, it needs to make sure that certain things are at certain locations that they're memory aligned. Or in other words, that they, they fall onto um, specific memory boundaries. Um, well, you know, sometimes they don't always uh, do that. And so in order to make sure that some of these functions or some of these memory locations fall onto the, the correct memory locations or are memory aligned, it needs to kind of pad the, the place before it. Um, and the way that it does that in between functions is that it puts CCs there um, to memory pad or to pad things out so that they fall onto the right uh, memory locations. Now, I've never seen or I've never heard um, the specific reason why it uses CCs, but I really suspect that the reason it uses CCs or the interrupt threes um, are because if for some reason the program would not, would start working improperly and memory would get corrupted and it would try to start executing the code uh, in between the functions uh, that's being used for memory alignment, um, with the CCs there, it should automatically crash because it will throw a debugger exception and there's nothing debugging it. So um, the operating system should then capture it. And that's when you see uh, those, uh, those crash errors. 
Um, but that's why there are those CCs in there to begin with. Um, and you'll often see too, or not often, but sometimes you'll see uh, one of these um, INT3 scans um, implemented within malware, uh, not well or, or, or poorly. And what it'll do is it will always detect that it's being debugged because it's gonna, it will run across these CCs. Um, so that's, uh, you could come across that. And that's just uh, really just bad code on the, the attacker's part. So um, to show you as well, you know, what this looks like. <clears throat> um, on, let me close the chat window. This chat window does not want to come up. All right, so in our source code, uh, this is all actually implemented in a function called anti-debug. Um, and the is debugger present is actually really simple. You can see it right here. It's just calling is debugger present. Um, and it detects if the value that's returned is true or false. Um, and that tells you whether or not that it's the uh, is debugger present. Um, the, the code for the in three scan is a little bit more complicated. Um, <clears throat> it, the code itself will, um, it passes in this value, which I've called foo end. And what that is, is that's actually just a memory location or a function that's specified directly after our main function. Um, so here's our main function. Um, this foo end function is uh, specified directly after. And the reason I do that is because I have not, uh, the code that I've seen, um, it uses this to figure out where the end of the function is because there's really no good way to figure out where the end of the function is in an assembler. You have to kind of use this, um, this memory value. So it passes that into this function. Um, then it takes uh, that, that value and subtracts one from it. So it's the byte before the end of the, the function. Um, and then it just starts scrolling backwards through it to get past the CCs that are in the alignment, um, that are being used for the alignment. Um, and then it knows, then once it gets to a value that's not a CC, then it knows in theory that it's at the end of the main function. Uh, and then it can determine the size. And then basically all it does is it goes through and looks at each of these bytes and looks to see if uh, they're set to a CC. And if they are in this particular case, it um, throws up this me the message box that we saw. So that's really all it's doing. It's just really just a, a big loop that's going through and looking for the, the CC byte. All right. So are there any questions on that? Cool, not seeing any, so let's continue on. So <clears throat> there's another thing that I wanted to talk about, and unfortunately I do not have an example of this, but I am going to try to find a, um, uh, an example of, of this uh, to send out, um, are TLS callbacks. Now, TLS, uh, there, within Windows, uh, there is a data type that provides uh, per thread storage for variables. Um, what that means is that, you know, if you have a multi-threaded program and technically all programs now are multi-threaded, um, single threaded programs or normal programs um, may just only have one thread. Um, but you, the Windows can provide uh, storage for variables uh, or it needs to be able to provide storage for variables in, in multi-threaded programs for each thread. And the way that it does this is through the TLS section. Um, there, you, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the PE header for a program and you see a section called .tls, that means that uh, it has this uh, thread local storage, which is what TLS stands for, uh, section in it for the, the per thread storage of variables. Now, the interesting thing is the TLS section um, or TLS objects, uh, there are functions in there for the initialization and termination of these objects. Uh, for, for initializing the local variables in the thread and then terminating and, and getting rid of them and cleaning them up. Um, now, attackers use this uh, to their advantage because the initialization of the TLS objects is actually called before the startup of the program. So what this means is if your debugger does not understand what TLS is and doesn't understand that there is, um, that this code gets uh, called before the startup of a program, it may allow the TLS initialization to get called uh, and run before it stops. So in other words, if the attacker puts malicious code in the, um, 
initialization of the TLS object that gets run before your debugger stops, your malware is going to be running code on your uh, system that uh, before your debugger stops it. And I have seen malware um, implement almost entire its entire uh, um, body of code within the initialization of TLS. So if your debugger does not stop the, uh, the code from running in the TLS objects or the TLS initialization, the malware is going to run before you even get a chance to stop it. Um, fortunately, um, X64 debug does uh, do this. Um, first off, if you ever see the presence of a TLS section, um, it is it should should always be suspicious to you. Um, again, you can look into a uh, a PE header, and you should see a section called TLS. Um, if you look in the header as well, there is a section in the header called address of callbacks. If that has a value in it, that's an indication that the uh, that TLS is being used. And then if you go into IDA Pro um, and you go to its entry point listings with, by hitting control E, you'll see the TLS callbacks listed in there. Um, the one, I, I did say that um, the presence of a TLS section is always, TLS section is always suspicious. The one, um, caveat to that that I found is that uh, Delphi programs or programs that are written in Delphi, which is a um, Pascal-like language, um, always seem to have TLS uh, in it, sections in there. Um, and Delphi is actually still used a lot, um, especially for malware that comes out of Eastern Europe. I, I still see a lot of Delphi programs coming out of there, um, which stinks because Delphi programs are a pain in the butt to reverse. But digress. Um, so uh, X64 debug, uh, you can set it up to stop callbacks uh, or stop before callbacks are called. And you do this by going into the option. Here, let me just show you. Um, you do this, if I can get out of here. Um, you do this by going into the options uh, menu, then preferences, and then events, and make sure that TLS callbacks are checked. By default, they are checked. They, they will, um, uh, X32 and X64 debug by default will stop at TLS callbacks. And you can actually see in here, you know, all the different places that um, the, de the debugger will automatically stop at uh, if you set it. Um, which is kind of interesting because, you know, you can set it so that whenever you enter or load or unload a DLL, it'll automatically stop, which, you know, we may talk about next week when we talk about how to unpack uh, software or how to unpack malware. But I, I just wanted to, you know, mention TLS callbacks because that this is a way that malware will uh, use in order to kind of execute code before your debugger um, stops it. And fortunately, uh, this was more of a problem a, a while ago with um, with Ali debug when Ali debug was used uh, more often. Uh, now with X64 debug and Win debug and uh, even the uh, debugger within IDA Pro, I believe they all will stop on TLS callbacks by default. So, all right, so that takes us uh, out of anti-debugging and now into anti-VM and anti-sandbox uh, code. Um, are there any questions on anti-debugging before we move on? doesn't look like it. Um, all right, so let's uh, keep going. Actually, there's a, there's a late question there. Oh, okay, all right. Why are we using Visual Studio? Okay. Yeah, uh, so the reason I'm using Visual Studio is because, yeah, I just downloaded it for free. Um, there is a community edition of Visual Studio, which allows you to um, uh, compile C Sharp, C++, and then one other language. Um, for free. It's essentially the, the same, you know, compiler that the enterprise version is. Um, it does come with uh, free uh, three months of uh, Pluralsight too. And, you know, if you wanted to download that and, you know, use uh, the Pluralsight, you could go see my uh, uh, Pluralsight malware analysis course, along with, you know, a number of other really great courses. Um, but uh, to get back to Gerda's question, you, you could use, um, you know, any other open source equivalent. Uh, there's Ming, Min GW is another, is an open source uh, compiler uh, for Windows. 
Um, I know that on Linux, the GCC and <coughs> compiler, I'm pretty sure you can cross compile into uh, Windows uh, code. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of uh, different ones. Um, Adam, I'm not uh, familiar with. Uh, it's a text editor. Can you compile from it? Can you, can you set it up to, as like an IDE for your compiler? Which would be kind of cool because admittedly the, um, the IDE within Visual Studio is not the easiest to use, at least for me. But really, the, there's really no specific reason why I'm using Visual Studio. It's just because what I had downloaded and what I started using. Um, you could very much use uh, any other compiler and do implement all these techniques that we've talked about. The, the, the syntax may be a little bit different because you're dealing with a little bit uh, a compiler um, or a different compiler, um, but you can absolutely do that. Um, another one that I've uh, been using as well um, for some of the examples uh, earlier in the, in the earlier sessions, I wasn't actually writing them in, in C, I was actually writing them in pure assembler. Um, and I was using uh, an assembler called Go Assembler. Um, and it's actually really easy to use. The, the syntax is a little bit weird. Um, it's not what I'm you know, typically used to because I, I learned how to write assembler with uh, Microsoft Assembler Masm. Um, but Go Assembler works uh, just as well and it's free. So, I mean, what it comes down to, um, any of these techniques you can implement in pretty much any language as long as they allow you to uh, uh, specify raw assembler commands. Um, so, so hopefully that answers your question. But <clears throat> let's go and start then talking about anti-BM and anti-sandbox. Unfortunately, I do not have any examples of this uh, again in the, um, in the example code. Um, I will try to find examples of this as well. But the, fortunately, these ones are actually pretty easy to spot. Um, so virtual machines and sandboxes, um, we use them all the time as malware analysts uh, for a safe environment to analyze malware. Uh, and there are so many advantages to using virtual machines for malware analysis. Uh, not only is it segmenting uh, the malicious code from your network uh, onto this virtual system, you can set up snapshots so that you can automatically jump back into that snapshot uh, very quickly. You don't have to worry about, you know, reloading an entire OS uh, whenever you want to uh, run malware from a clean system uh, and, and so on. Um, and because of this, you know, malware uh, has some techniques that it can use to detect these systems, the virtual machines, um, to know that they're being analyzed. Um, and this goes just as well for all the like online sandboxes. And there are actually um, uh, malware analysis specific sandboxes that you can either buy or use online. So for example, um, Cuckoo Sandbox is, is one example of this. Uh, and the online version of that is at uh, malware.com, M-A-L-W-R.com. Um, there are some other commercials ones. There's um, the Joe Sandbox. There's Hybrid Analysis. There's uh, FireEye has their own. Um, if you're a member of InfraGuard, I'm pretty sure InfraGuard has their own online sandbox that you can throw malware onto. And there are, my point is there are just tons and tons of both commercial and freely available sandboxes that you can upload malware to to have it executed in there. So you don't even have to have an environment to run malware and you can just use one of these free online ones. Well, Malware authors know this. They, they know that we use these sandboxes. We, they know that we use these virtual machines. And so they want to detect when they're in these virtual machines and when they're in the <coughs> So that when they go in uh, or when you run them in there, they right. can act differently. And, and like I said at the beginning of, of this session, I'm, I'm seeing more and more malware move away from purely detecting virtual machines and more towards uh, detecting the analysis tools that we use and the, the, the actual online sandboxes. Um, again, because when you, um, uh, if you just detect pure sandboxes, if you're just detecting if you're in VMware and you're not, uh, and you don't run in VMware, then you can miss out compromising an entire, you know, VM infrastructure in some organization. Um, and so it really just wants to make sure that it's not working for the analysts. And there are a number of ways that it can, that it can do that. Um, the first is 
you know, in order to detect if it's in a VM or in, in a virtual machine, it can look at the system for artifacts of virtual machines. And, you know, when you're in a virtual machine, um, it's going, there are lots of different artifacts that are left behind that will give indication that, it, that it's in a virtual machine. Um, if you have the VM guest tools in there, it can search the process list and look for those uh, VMware uh, guest tools or the, the VBox tools for VirtualBox. Um, it can look for specific file names that are related to either a virtual machine or the virtual machine programs or even your analysis tools. If you use um, like, like we, like we use, um, Ida pro, it, it can look for the file name Ida Q.exe or Ida G.exe, which are typically Ida pros file names. Um, it can look for specific registry entries. It, it may not even just look for, uh, like the, the EULA entries for process monitor. It, it will look for virtual machine, uh, entries, um, this registry entries specific to virtual machines, same with services and the same with handles. Um, hardware, it, it can start looking for um, different uh, hardware names or hardware IDs that are hard coded into uh, VMware or, or virtual machines. If you looked at, I believe there was a talk this uh, year at DerbyCon about breaking out of virtual machines, specifically, I believe it was VMware. And one of the ways that they did that is because VMware has a number of what's called ports. Uh, set up within the virtual machine itself that you cannot change. And they're hard coded with very specific names. Um, I believe one um, is called like VMX. And in a normal operating system, you won't have one of these ports called VMX. You'll only have that port within uh, VMware, within a, within a operating system running underneath VMware. And so all, all malware has to do is go in and look for a port named VMX. And because you can't change that without, um, without patching the VMware code itself, which would probably make it unstable, uh, it's a very good way of detecting whether or not it's in VMware. Uh, and then there are probably there are probably hundreds of other places where uh, malware can detect that it's in a VM. Um, here are just a couple of VM artifacts that uh, it may look for. Um, some of these are related to programs, like uh, in the first column we have like NT-ICE and File VXD and FileMon and RegMon and, and Proc VXD uh, and then ProcMon. These are strings or, or um, locations uh, related to specific programs that it will look for. Um, there's, uh, it could be looking for VMware or VBox or VM Mouse. Um, there's SP, it can look for DLLs that are loaded, like SBIE DLL, which is um, Sandbox IE, which is a, a sandboxing program, or debug help DLL, which is related to one of the debuggers. I can't remember which one. Um, it can look at the host names uh, of the program or of the, of the machine it's on. There are a number of different hard host names of online sandboxes, which are hard coded. And these are just a, a couple of those. Um, it can look at the, what user you're logged in as, uh, and you know, see if it's um, see if it's a, a user, uh, a known user of a uh, specific um, uh, online sandbox, and, and so on. And there are just you know a lot of different ones, uh, things that it can look at. Um, so Jerry has a question: Do I have any opinion for using sandboxes versus containers versus jails? Um, I've used a physical machine running seven or something similar, and I seem to get different results when running on physical. Um, so I really prefer using VM sandboxes. Uh, I have in the past though, used physical systems. Um, so one of the things that I found is that, um, malware is, Malware really varies in its effectiveness for detecting that it's in a virtual machine or within a sandbox. And some, some are better than others. And the ones that are really good, no matter what you do, you're going to, um, you're, you're going, you're not going to be able to get around it without having to go in and patch a lot of code. And if that code is packed, then that means that you have to unpack it and then you have to patch it. And then it becomes a big deal. And sometimes it's just easier to have a physical box, uh, around that you can throw it on. Um, that being said, um, I really prefer sandboxes, um, using those when I can. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't used containers or jails too much because, um, those are still, in my opinion, running too close to the actual, uh, operating system. Uh, and so I tend to avoid those, uh, when I can. Um, 
Did that answer your question? I, I think I got what you were asking, correct? Not, yep, cool, all right. <clears throat> all right. Um, so fortunately, um, a lot of these artifacts that we're, uh, that we're seeing on this page, which uh, malware is detecting, um, most of those are basically being done around string comparison. In other words, it's scanning specific spots within the, uh, within the program and it's doing a string comparison. Is you know, this process this name? Is this process this name? And, and, and so on. Um, so there are some ways to get around it. Um, you can either patch your code to change what it's looking for or patch the malware code to change what it's looking for. Um, again, you'll, you'll have to get in there and actually patch it to do it, uh, which isn't necessarily difficult, but um, if you're not comfortable with doing that, then, then you might not want to. Um, you may want to remove or modify the virtual machine. In other words, remove the guest tools, um, rename your analysis tools, rename X32 debug to you know, notepad or something like that. So it, when it's scanning the process list, it doesn't see X32 debug. Um, or have you even seen uh, uh, analysts do something like load a rootkit onto your system, onto your analysis system, and use that to hide your virtual machine and, and, and tools. Um, that's actually pretty effective. It, well, it's actually pretty effective until your malware loads a rootkit and the two rootkits collide and then you blue screen your box. Um, but it, it's still one way, uh, one way to do it. Another effective way that I've seen is um, if you're having trouble with uh, in one VM, so let's say the malware is consistently finding that it's in VMware, you know, try a different VM, try VirtualBox, or try a VM like Zen, which isn't used as much. Um, uh, the, the two most commonly detected virtual machines are VirtualBox and, and VMware because they're the most popular ones out there. Um, you know, try Parallels uh, if you have a Mac available, try Zen. Uh, and uh, you may be able to get around it using that. I've, I've actually had really good luck with running virtual machines under the Zen VM because it works a little bit differently and it's detected a little bit differently. Um, so one of the interesting things about uh, virtual machines is that uh, for performance reasons, virtual machines don't virtualize all the instructions. Um, the, if you ever look at the, you can actually download the documentation for the uh, x86 and x64 CPU instruction sets, and they're they're pretty big, um, and there are a lot of instructions that really don't ever get used except for in very specific purposes like 3D graphics rendering or uh, floating point operations, and they're rarely used if at all. And if they are used, it's not gonna be used on something that a virtual machine uh, is on. Um, so VMs don't virtualize all instructions. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, um, there are some instructions that actually generate different results if they're in a, a virtual machine or not. So malware can actually run these instructions, uh, these instructions that either aren't uh, virtualized in a VM or that generate different instructions and um, compare the results to what a real, what uh, the results on a real hardware would look like. And then they can use this to detect whether or not they're in a VM. Um, if you've ever heard of red pill or no pill techniques, this is how they work. They essentially run instructions that they know don't run properly or at all within a virtual machine and see what the result is. If they find that it's not the result that they want it to be, then they know that they're in a virtual machine and not on real hardware. Um, here are some instructions that are used to the check for virtual machines. Um, if you ever see any of these instructions in malware, <laughs> it's looking to see if it's in a virtual machine. And so my, uh, my best suggestion is to take these um, and then just patch them out, just replace them with no ops. Um, and then uh, it, uh, not only these instructions, but also the, the, the comparison and the check that it's doing right afterwards to see if it's in a virtual machine um, and just no opt them out. And then it will just totally bypass that. And, and obviously you need to be comfortable with, with patching a uh, program in order to do that, but um, that's one way to do it. All right, so are there any, right, is chat gonna pull up? 
Yeah. All right. So we do have some questions. All right. So let me jump back to the first one. Um, so who said this? Jerry asked, I've been having a lot of problems where the malware is never complete. They are loading the base and some random thing to pull down the payload. Seems they have switched to a lot of base kits with payload downloaders. I have a hard time getting this through uh, reverse since it's payload is usually one time download and then the site changes. Um, all right, so basically uh, what Jerry is describing is there's some malware out there now which will install like a base um, uh, shell essentially and then it will go out and it will download payloads in real time and execute those payloads and because it's downloading those payloads the payload never really touches disk now now this isn't fileless malware I please don't uh, confuse it with that because if you if Michael Goff is listening and he hears that he will flip out um, for good reason uh, honestly um, but it's basically loading the instructions in real time as it downloads this. A really good example of this actually is Metasploit with Meterpreter. That's essentially how Meterpreter works. Um, when you run Meterpreter, it downloads the shell program onto the, the system, the compromised system. And then when you execute commands, it sends the code as you execute it. Um, so the, the Jerry's question is, you know, how, how do you analyze this? I don't have a good uh, answer for that because I've run into the same problem. Um, somebody is suggesting uh, network forensics to help you out there to carve the file packets out. Um, yes, that is definitely a way to do it. Um, that's the way that I would look at it because if it's downloading it, it's downloading essentially shell code and then you can see what that shell code is doing. Um, the other way that I would suggest, and Shecky just mentioned it, is memory forensics. If you can grab the memory uh, from there, um, uh, from that system that has it on there, you should then be able to dump the malware from memory and see all of the uh, in-memory loaded stuff that's in there and, and analyze it from there. Um, <clears throat> this, you are, trust me, you are not the only one having this issue. I, I once worked a very large uh, case or a case where um, a number of systems were compromised and it used a malware very similar to this where only the shell of the malware would be loaded onto the system, um, and then it would it would download the uh, the the additional instructions in in kind of real time. Well, that was great um, if we would have been able to capture memory or or we had the the network forensics from it. Unfortunately, we didn't have either, and all of the systems rebooted the next day. So we basically lost everything, all of our evidence. Unfortunately, um, so you are not the only one who who is having trouble with this. Um, I, if you ever come across a, uh, a good um, way to get around that or to analyze that, please let us all know because eventually somebody else is going to run into this as well. But I think the instruction or the suggestions that people made with either network forensics or memory for forensics um, is uh, uh, probably the best way to go. All right. Um, so some more conversation going on. Um, and again, I'm going to, oops, I am going to, oh crap, sorry. I am going to uh, send out this, uh, um, I will upload this uh, presentation after uh, we're done here uh, into our um, shared folder. But here are some, these are some resources from where I got a lot of this information from. Um, one of these, this, um, This uh, anti-debug.pdf paper is excellent. It actually goes through and um, talks about a number of these techniques in, in detail. And um, I believe that is the paper that I'm thinking of. Um, I think it was Veracode uh, that published that. And they just go through about two or three dozen different anti-debugging and anti-disassembling techniques, how they work and even give sample code on if you want to try it out for yourself or you know what that code would look like. But that is the end of this session. Um, like I said, there's no homework uh, for, for this one. Um, you do have the, uh, the, the proof of concepts program along with the source code that I uploaded there if you want to look at it. Um, I will try to find some examples um, to send out throughout the week. I, in fact, I know I have a couple examples. I will, will find that and, and send those out as well to everybody if you want to check those out. 
Um, but with that, uh, does anybody have any uh, other questions, either on this or anything else that we've covered so far in, in, in any of the sessions? Do we get into fileless malware? Um, no, we're not really going to get into fileless malware. Um, trying to think of some good resources. Like I said, um, Michael Goff has a presentation on it, which is really good. Um, there are a couple other fileless malware presentations. Um, that is definitely something that I would look for in another course. In fact, I have a course that I'm creating specifically around that. So I would be more than happy to do that in the future at some point. All right. Well, um, uh, I guess that's it for this week. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, again, like I said, hit up uh, Tyler at uh, Security Shoggoth. Um, he's Sec Shoggoth on Twitter, so just Sec, and then you know how you're seeing it on the screen there. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to reach out to the BreakSec team, uh, we're at BreakSec on Twitter uh, or bds.podcast at gmail.com. All right, everyone, have a great week. See All right. you.